right, well, it's um, seven o'clock, so we're going to go ahead and get started, and we may have a few people um, still joining us, but uh, welcome to Buzzworthy Books. Um, my name is Beth, and I'm the adult programming librarian, um, and I'm joined by Angela Strathman, who is our reader services librarian. Um, this is our second uh, installment of Buzzworthy Books, so um, we are doing this quarterly, and our next one will be on August 22nd at 7 p.m., also here on Zoom, and uh, you can visit our YouTube channel and uh, see the recording from the earlier session if you missed that as well, um, but um, we have a small group this evening, so you are welcome to type in the chat uh, if you have questions or comments. Um, and I do have a link um, to the list of books that Angie will be talking about this evening. So I will be posting that in the chat as well as emailing it to everybody uh, with the survey for tonight's program. So you don't have to frantically uh, write as Angie is talking this evening. But with that, I am going to turn it over to her and mute myself. All right. Thank you, Beth. Um, uh, as Beth said, this is our second installment. And with these presentations, we um, tend to highlight the books that are brand new but don't have huge holds lists. So all the books I'm talking about right now should be available now in at least one format. Um, or have a very, very short hold skew, um, at least at the time that I put this together. Um, so uh, hopefully you will find something in uh, whatever genre you most like to read. I will be highlighting books from lots of different genres, including nonfiction, but I have so many titles I'm excited to share. So let me go ahead and get started. Um, up first, we have The Farewell Tour by Stephanie Clifford. This one um, begins in 1980. Lillian Waters is a country music star who finally decides that it's time to hang her hat up on her career after she has some vocal problems. But first, there's one last tour through various honky-tonk venues as well as her personal history. So Lillian reflects back on her music career, her struggles to try to make it to the top of Nashville uh, and to stay there, and her collaborators in the business as she takes to the stage for one last hurrah. But the process of leaving the stage also means confronting life without it, uh, including her childhood and family secrets she left behind in pursuit of her musical fame. So Clifford's novel brings all of the emotion and storytelling of a really great country song to Lillian's life story. So if you like a book that kind of spans one person's life, this one covers Lillian's life from the Great Depression all the way up till the end of her career in 1980, uh, you might want to tune into this one, as well as readers who enjoy the ups and downs of music stardom, like the recent Daisy Jones and the Six, for example. And for something completely different, up next, we have Cold People by Tom Rob Smith. This is a post-apocalyptic story. An alien invasion gives humans 30 days to make their way to Antarctica, which is going to be their last place of refuge on the planet. This is a genre blending tale that follows several characters in their journey to survival, but it also addresses the ethical dilemmas faced by the survivors Are you still not seeing my slides? This cold people? Now we are. Okay. Um so um this one leaves humans or so this one also not only tells the survival story but also the ethical dilemmas faced by the survivors who sacrificed all to make it there. So this one, it's not just the mysterious invading force that is threatening humanity, it's also the decisions they make in trying to rebuild, including the use of genetic engineering. Uh, 
So this is a story that has a little bit of everything. It's got suspense, it's got survival, it's very atmospheric with its Antarctic setting, and it's also thought-provoking and terrifying in its premise. Up next, we have Red London by Alma Katsu. Alma Katsu is press, perhaps best known for her historical horror novels, like The Hunger, which takes the story of the Donner Party and gives it a supernatural twist, or The Fervor, which takes place during Japanese internment. But before she was a successful horror novelist, she was a longtime CIA agent. Um, so she channels that experience and expertise into her second Lindsay Duncan espionage thriller, though this one can also be read as a standalone, so don't worry, you don't have to read the first one um, first. This is, takes place in a near future Russia where Vladimir Putin has been ousted following the war in Ukraine, and Lindsay is sent on a special mission to Russia. Once she's there, though, however, she is given a very different assignment after a wealthy oligarch named Mikhail Rotenberg's home is attacked, leaving him increasingly vulnerable and paranoid. So Lindsay's assignment is to befriend Rotenberg's English wife, Emily, in order to convince her to give up what her husband might know. This is an espionage novel that is all about the people and not about the gadgetry and techniques, as the success of Lindsay's mission depends on how well she can gain Emily's trust. Fans of Ava Glass's um, Alias Emma, Jason Matthews' Red Sparrow, or the novels of Karen Cleveland will want to give this one a look. Um, next, we have Full Exposure by um, Tian Kim Lam. Um, and this one is New Orleans really comes to life in this romance novel. It's an opposite to tract romance. Josie is a photographer who is never one to deviate from her plans. Spencer is a documentary filmmaker with a bit more of a laissez-faire kind of attitude. Both of them are in New Orleans temporarily. Josie is just there for a week's long vacation, while Spencer has temporarily relocated to make a documentary film about his family, who was the first Vietnamese Mardi Gras crew. Can the two meld their disparate personality styles for a short fling, but can they, their love sustain itself afterwards? This one is rich with lots of cultural detail, um, the sights and sounds and culture and community and food of New Orleans, and also lots of character clashes en route to this couple's happy ending. Next, we have um, a nonfiction book, All the Beauty in the World by Patrick Ringley. This is a memoir. If you loved from the mixed up files of Mrs. Basil E. Frankweiler as a child and um, thought there was nothing better than spending a week long um, in the Metropolitan Museum of Art, this is the book for you. This is about the author's memoir about a decade spent as a guard at the Metropolitan Museum. After the death of his older brother, the author quit his job at the New Yorker and was looking for a job with a little bit less pressure. And so he signed up for guard duty at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And in his decade of work there, he got to know the museum, its artwork and its history, as, long, as well as his fellow guards and the habits and quirks of the various museum goers. It was also a decade spent exploring his own personal grief, uh, his growing family, and general philosophical musings on life's purpose and meaning. Brinley focuses on a few pieces of art that particularly moved him at the museum, mostly lesser known ones. So you get a little bit of a behind the scenes look at the museum and what keeps it going, as well as some of the more amusing or typical antics from its guests. But mostly, it's an invitation for us as readers to look closer at the art to be found within the walls and to do so not behind the lens of a camera or with an agenda to check off, but with an open mind and open eyes to discover what speaks personally to us and why. And that invitation to look closer also extends to the people, too, 
So in this case, it is the overlooked museum guards that can stand in for any other people we view mostly in the background for their service and not their humanity. And this one does have a bit of a holds list, but I really enjoyed it. And so I wanted to feature it here. Um, next, we have a fiction, a family story, life and other love songs by Anissa Gray. This one follows the various members and perspectives of the Armstead family from the 1960s to the present. And it follows them from Alabama to Detroit to New York. The defining event for this family is the disappearance of Oz Armstead on his 37th birthday. Um, leaving behind wife Deborah, daughter Trinity, and a brother, but no note or any clues to why he disappeared. The story unfolds through, through the perspectives of all the different family members, both before and after Oz's disappearance. This one is rich with themes of addiction, um, life in the closet, of failed ambitions, um, and about the importance of trust and commitment. Um, all threaded throughout the novel, but its major focus is on the weight of our past and generational trauma, and how we are the product of those who come before us, and how we help shape those who come after us. If you're looking for something a little bit more adventurous, we have Blind Spots by Thomas Mullen. This is a riveting speculative fiction crime thriller where you really and literally can't believe your eyes. A virus slowly renders most of humanity gradually blind, uh, but fortunately, a tech company was on the verge of developing assistive technology called a vitter before the blinding which works for vision the same way cochlear implants do for hearing. Um, Mark Owens is a homicide detective and while the blinding was happening, the world was rife with corruption and the police were often the source of that corruption. Afterwards, it's criminals who are taking advantage of the new, new technology too. For example, rape is really prevalent because all a criminal has to do is disarm someone's blind or bitter from behind, and there's suddenly no eyewitness to the crime. But Mark soon discovers something even more disturbing. After two scientists wind up dead, he sees a possible suspect, or rather he sees a black blur in place of the suspect. It appears someone has been able to hack into the technology in order to disguise their identities. This is a genre blending speculative thriller that is much more mystery than science fiction, but it will appeal to fans of Blake Crouch, Rob Hart, and John Mars. Next, we have Nathan Oates's A Flaw in the Design. This one is also a bit of a mystery, but it's a little bit more of the domestic suspenseful variety. Gill is a creative writing professor in Vermont who reluctantly takes in his 17-year-old nephew, Matthew, after Matthew's parents were killed in a car accident. Gill's reservations stem from an incident in the past when Matthew potentially endangered Gill's daughter. But no one else seems to see Matthew's dark side even as Matthew's writing becomes increasingly disturbing. As the two of them face off, the reader is left wondering, is Gil just paranoid or is Matthew really a psychopath? Tensions mount until a surprising ending where you get to find out which one's true. Um, next, we have some historical fiction uh, with Dust Child. Uh, when Finn uh, Fan Kuei Mai's debut, The Mountain Sing, was a sweeping historical epic. The follow-up, Dust Child, is equally ambitious, following the legacy of the Vietnam War on both American and Vietnamese characters. Dan was a Black American soldier, and now in the present, he has returned to Vietnam uh, in order to reckon with his past in hopes of relieving his PTSD. Meanwhile, Fong is the son of an American soldier and a Vietnamese mother, and is in search of his parents and a possible way out of Vietnam. Both of these searches and stories intersect in a riveting narrative that explores the richer legacy of the Vietnam War, 
through this modern day storyline and also flashbacks to 1969 and the story of two sisters and a love story between a soldier and a Vietnamese woman. Next, we have a little bit more of a, a um, traditional romance. This one is The Neighbor Favor by Christina Forrest. Lily works in publishing, and her favorite book is a little-known fantasy novel written by a mysterious and reclusive English author named N.R. Strickland. One day, she's surprised to discover that the author has a new website, and she dashes off a fan email, but she doesn't expect him to come back to her with a response. But in our Strickland not only answers her, but it starts a months long email correspondence between the two uh, before he, sent, he suddenly ghosts her before their first FaceTime conversation. It turns out that in our Strickland is really Nick, an American author using a British pseudonym in part to hide his identity from his family. After the publisher of his novel goes bankrupt, he ekes out a living as a nomadic travel writer, which is just fine because he's super commitment skittish himself. But when Nick's book is rediscovered and he moves to New York, he finds out that his super cute new neighbor is actually Lily, the woman he met over email. Of all the buildings in New York. This book begins with Lily and Nick's emails, uh, which take out the first part of the book. So if you like epistolary romances, you want to give this one a shot, uh, as well as readers who enjoy the second chance romance trope or novels with lots of um, bookish settings, um, like Um, bookish settings like the novels, uh, romance novels of Emily Henry or Better Than Fiction by Alexis Martin. Next, we have some more nonfiction um, with The Things We Make by Bill Hammack. If you are someone like me who persisted way too long in believing that engineers were the people who drive trains and wondered why so many people went to college for that, then this is the book for you. Um, Bill Hammack runs the award-winning YouTube channel, Engineer Guy, where he breaks down complex topics into um, easy to understand and accessible videos. And the things we make, he takes that same approach to in book form to the history and philosophy and the marvels of engineering, highlighting some of the inventions from the cathedrals to more modern things like ceramic dishes. He describes science as a search for knowledge, while engineering searches for solutions. So in the process, he shows how this problem-solving approach led to Masons building impressive cathedrals with no knowledge of math or physics, um, but instead, the knowledge passed down from their peers, from trial and error, and homemade riggings like using a piece of string to calculate how thick to build the walls. If you like fans of really sweeping, accessible writing on science and culture, like Stephen Johnson's How We Got to Now, or Simon Winchester's new book, Knowing What We Know, uh, then you'll want to pick this one up, as well as those readers who want some impressive tidbits to throw out in conversation to impress their family members or dinner companions with their cool facts. All right, next we have Our Best Intentions um, by Babuti Jane. This one centers around a crime in the suburbs of Westchester County, New York, and what it reveals about the town's social class and race divisions. These tensions are voiced through several characters, including Angie, the Indian American teenager who discovers a popular white boy who has been stabbed, Angie's immigrant father, and other characters who all bring different pieces of the story and perspectives to the crime, its aftermath, and what justice actually means in a case like this. This is a very layered character story with lots of rich themes, all told very propulsively and suspensefully. It will appeal to readers who enjoyed Celeste Ng's Everything I Never Told You or Little Fires Everywhere, Kylie Reed's Such a Fun Age, 
or Steph Cha's Your House Will Pay, or even fans of Angie, Angie Thomas's young adult title, The Hate You Give. Uh, this one would be a great choice for book groups because there's lots of different themes and characters uh, and their choices to discuss. Um, so for, um, if you're looking for a little bit more adventure and fun and fantasy, you might like the adventures, um, of Amina Al-Safiri by Shannon Chakraborty. Shannon Chakraborty's beloved Devabad trilogy was a delightful historical fantasy series with elements of Islamic history, culture, and folklore. Her latest series starter takes to the high seas for a swashbuckling tale of adventure, featuring legendary pirate Amina al Sarafi. Uh, she's just retired from her notorious career on the high seas, but she's not so settled that she isn't tempted to try out one last adventure and a chance to secure her legacy. A wealthy woman asks her to track down a kidnapped daughter, so Amina gets the crew back together for one last time. But this is also fantasy, so Amina and her crew also are hunting down magical artifacts, they're dodging some sea monsters, and they deal with dark magic and much more. What sets this is series apart is its heroine of a certain age, uh, proving that legendary adventurers come in every age and every gender. It also brings in elements of Southwest Asian, North African, and Islamic culture. This one has lots of magic and mayhem, a bit of snark and humor, and lots of fun. Next, we have uh, a different kind of fun with the Regency Romance, Infamous by Lex Croucher. Uh, in Regency England, Edith, or Eddie Miller wants two things. She wants people to read her stories and increasingly she wants something more with her best friend, Rose. Rose, however, is a bit more conventional and is starting to make some noise about abandoning their childhood pact to never marry in favor of a more settled place in society through a traditional marriage. Enter Nash Nicholson, who is a charming poet and a Lord Byron Sandin, or rival, who introduces Eddie to an unconventional circle of artists and writers, and Eddie starts to come into her own and kind of realize what she really wants. This LGBTQ historical rom-com will appeal to readers who enjoy coming-of-age themes, colorful characters, and laugh-out-loud dialogue. The cover proclaims this one to be Booksmart meets Bridgerton, so those looking for slightly more modern twists and historical settings will want to get this one a go. Next up, we have something darker with Everybody Knows by Jordan Harper. May works as a publicist for a PR form. PR firm, and her job is to sort out the most sinister misde misdeeds of her wealthy and famous Hollywood clients and make them disappear. When May's boss is murdered, she begins to investigate with the help of a former cop who's also now working for the private sector. This is a gritty neo-noir story that is atmospheric. It's filled with sleazy and sordid characters. Even our main characters uh, are not quite good guys. Uh, their job is to help the even worse guys get away with it. Um, but this hard-boiled Hollywood setting will appeal to readers who enjoy James Elroy's books or the movies based on them, or the punchy prose of writers like Robert Crace or even all the way back to Raymond Chandler. Harper was born and raised in Missouri, so he has some local connections. He's also an Edgar Award winner and a former writer and producer for TV, including The Mentalist and the 2019 TV movie for LA Confidential. Next, we have some more historic, historical fiction with the haunting historical novel, Stealing by Margaret Verbal. Margaret Verbal is a Cherokee woman. She's also a former Pulitzer Prize finalist. 
And her latest is heartbreaking historical fiction that brings to light the stories of Native Americans who were forced to attend boarding schools. After her mother's death, Kit Crockett is raised by her loving white single dad with some help from her mother's Cherokee community. She befriends a new neighbor named Bella and the two trade confidences. But there, when a tragic event occurs, Kit is forced to attend a Christian boarding school where she and her fellow boarders endure horrific abuse. Part of the story is told through Kit's journal entries and flashbacks to her life before boarding school. The story is told through Kit's perspective, and so this naive child's eye view lends further weight and gravity to the mistreatment and to the prejudice and to the misunderstandings that occur. Readers who are looking for stories from an indigenous history uh, who enjoy child narrators or fans of Louise Erdrich's The Roundhouse or Colson Whitehead's Nickel Boys, um, this is the natural audience for this one. Next up, we have more nonfiction with A Mystery of Mysteries by Mark Dubiziak. We all know Edgar Allan Poe as the brilliant but macabre author of very disturbing short stories, or perhaps you know him best as the poet who brought us the raven. But Mark DeWidziak's literary biography will give readers new insights into Poe's life and legacy. DeWidziak's narrative alternates between telling Poe's life story, he was an orphan of actor parents, uh, a successful athlete, he struggled with alcoholism and addiction, had a very unusual marriage to a much, much, scandalously much younger woman, uh, and several doomed love affairs. And he was a writer in his lifetime more known for his criticism than the genre-defining stories that he's currently known for. In alternate chapters, the book also speculates on Poe's last days and cause of death. Poe is found delirious, deliriously roaming the streets of Baltimore after he had disappeared for a few days, and then several days later succumbs to this mysterious condition. So the alternating chapters appropriately lend a bit of suspense and a bit of speculation uh, to this literary biography, which is fitting given Poe's own literary legacy in both of those genres. All right, if you enjoyed the movies of Moonstruck or My Big Fat Greek Wedding or like uh, tales of big, boisterous, and loving families, you'll want to try Verena Palladino's Jersey Italian Love Story by Terry Lynn DeFino. Verena is the 70-year-old 70 70-year-old 70 matriarch of the Palladino family. She runs the family's grocery and helps keep her large family in line. But Mothers can't but help but meddle. In this case, it's Verita's mom, 92-year-old Sylvia, who concocts a matchmaking plan to help her daughter find love. But this, again, is much more of a family story than it is a romance. And each member of, of these several generations of this big New Jersey Italian family has their own life changes and stories in store. There are also plenty of lively family meals, complete with recipes, and this very humorous and heartfelt story for fans of Adriana Trigiana or J. Ryan Stradell's uh, foodie fiction. All right, next up, we have something a bit more horrific. We have the horror novel, The Horror Debut, The Spite House by Johnny Compton. And if you're wondering what a spite house is, it is a house that is constructed with its own agenda. Someone builds a house in order to obstruct a neighbor's view or to be like a horrible eyesore in the neighborhood. Uh, and so often these homes will have unusual shapes and structures like the very, very skinny four story spite house of this story. And the spite house in Johnny Compton's chilling debut is also a threat to its inhabitants as well as the neighbors. In fact, it's so haunted that its owner is looking for a caretaker to document the paranormal activity that takes place there. 
Eric is the father of two girls, and this family is on the run, and we don't quite know what at first. And so Eric is moving his family from place to place, and so the Spite House seems to be the perfect refuge for him and his family, a place to lie low for a little bit. But will the house do the same? This is a slow building Southern Gothic that puts a new twist on the haunted house story. Um, it's told from multiple different characters' perspectives, and it has a very eerie backstory that has deep roots in history all the way back to the Civil War. Fans of Jordan Peele's uh, horror movies, John Searle's Help for the Haunted, or Shirley Jackson's The Hunting of Hill House, uh, will want to take up residence in the Spite House. Next, we have Liana de la Rosa's Anna Maria and the Fox. A lot of historical romances are really wonderful at immersing readers in the day-to-day -day life of a historical period, but sometimes they lack the much wider detail, the wider scope of history and global politics of the time. Not so with this novel, Anna Maria and the Fox, which satisfyingly blends in historical details and historical context alongside its beautiful and moving love story. Anna Maria is a Mexican heiress who was sent to England with her two younger sisters after France um, begins to occupy Mexico. Her culture and her status as the eldest daughter means that Anna Maria is constantly called upon to be the, the dutiful daughter. She's the good girl in the family. But the time in France offers her a little bit of a taste of freedom where she can start to explore what she wants and not just um, her family's desires. Her counterpart in this novel is Gideon, a biracial British politician who is determined to abolish the slave trade. When Anna Maria finds herself in potential danger, Gideon offers his protection via marriage. But in addition to his hand in marriage, his heart may come along with the package. Um, this is for fans of marriage of convenience, um, romance tropes, also fans of Adriana Herrera's um, recent Las Leonas series, or also Alyssa Cole's The Loyal League series as well. Um, next, we have Regrets Only. Uh, by Kieran Scott. Uh, this one uh, is for fans of Big Little Lies, uh, Mean Girls, potentially, or You Should Have Known by Jean um, Hanf Korlitz. Single mom, Paige Lancaster, used to have a job writing for a prestigious detective show on TV. But she has some career and personal breakdowns, and now she's forced to return back to her hometown uh, with her young daughter. While there, she ends up in the middle of her own drama. First, she's caught up in all of the shenanigans and the rivalries as part of the Parent Booster Association and all of the gossip associated there. But then she finds herself in even more hot water as a possible suspect when one of the husbands, who also happens to be Paige's high school sweetheart, is murdered. So Paige goes from writing about detectives for TV to becoming an amateur detective herself as she tries to untangle all of the petty dramas, the rivalries, the sinister secrets, and all the lots and lots of potential motives of her neighbors and co-parents. Again, this one is for fans of Big Little Lies, who will like the mix of mystery and interpersonal drama as well as fans of both of the Housewives franchises, uh, both the Bravo ones and also the Desperate ones, too. Next up, we have Venko by Sherry Demoline. Uh, a half Matisse woman, Lucky St. James, is a caretaker for her grandmother, Stella, who is beginning to show signs of dementia. When Lucky discovers a silver spoon, it leads to other discoveries for Lucky too. 
she finds out about a female empowerment empowerment firm that had called Den Denco, which has a very secret agenda. She also discovers the existence of magic and witches, and also a witch hunting assassin who happens to be gunning for her too. So Lucky sets out with Stella and Toe on a road trip, a road trip to Salem, Massachusetts, of course. Um, and uh, there she is, there are seven spoons in total, uh, including Lucky's, and the spoons and their finders must be reunited in order to usher in a new era for a witch coven. But that witch hunting has it, assassin, he's not far behind. This is a very fun and feminist fantasy. It will appear to readers who'd like to wield a little magic against misogyny. Witches are having a moment in literature these days, uh, and this is a different twist on the ultimate form of girl power. Um, so these are a few titles that are out right now that are uh, available for you to check out. And again, they are included in the list that Beth is going to be sharing. Um, but I do want to also um, give you a taste of some titles that are coming up soon that you might want to have your eye on. Uh, so if you want to get your holds placed now for when they come out in the next few months. Um, so up next, we have three books. These are books that are already available in the catalog for you to reserve. Uh, the first one is Linwin Barclay's The Light Maker. If you are a fan of Harlan Coben, um, you'll definitely want to make sure Linwin Barclay is also on your reading list. Uh, this one has a really fun premise. Uh, our main character is a writer who is hired to write backstories for people in witness protection programs. Uh, and his own father is part of the witness protection program, but he has gone missing, uh, which gives the main character an alternate uh, job of trying to track down his father. Uh, a romance that I'm looking forward to and that is coming out soon is We Could Be So Good by Cat Sebastian. Kat Sebastian was one of our featured writers in last year's romance genre con, and she delighted readers with her uh, humor. She was definitely a crowd favorite. I'm definitely looking forward to this one, which is a historical romance with a very different setting. It's set in the 1950s, and our main characters are a newspaper reporter who falls for the son of a newspaper tycoon. So think Newsies with an LGBTQ twist. Uh, so I'm looking forward to that one. And then I love, love, love Martha Wells' uh, series of science fiction novellas, The Murder Dot Diaries. And so I'm looking forward to her upcoming foray into fantasy called The Witch King. Um, this one has murder victims who've been revived. It has demons, it has dark magic, it has revolutions, and more importantly, it's written by Martha Wells. And so uh, I can't wait to get started on that one. And then there are a few um, titles that aren't in the catalog, but I'm also looking forward to. So these are just ones to have on your radar because they are coming soon. At the end of June, we have The Art Thief by Michael Finkel. You may know Michael Finkel for writing the story of the reclusive hermit and the stranger in the woods. Well, now he tackles another um, fascinating character a famous art thief who stole the paintings um, from various museums, not to sell them, but to admire them. I'm currently in the middle of Charlotte Illes as Not a Detective, a debut novel by Katie Siegel. If you are a fan of Encyclopedia Brown or Harriet the Spy, then you'll love this one. It imagines a childhood detective who stopped taking cases long ago. Now she's an adult, she's very aimless, and um, she's persuaded to try to solve one last mystery by her brother's fiance. And she has a couple of entertaining friends who are her co-sleuths um, in trying to figure out the mystery. 
And then another romance I'm looking forward to is Business or Pleasure by Rachel Lynn Solomon. This one, I tend to love all of the romances that have uh, bookish characters and settings. And this one follows a ghost writer. And her new contract is with a C-list celebrity. And that celebrity also happens to be a past one night stand. But that one night stand was really lackluster. And so they expand their contract so um, the main char character can help the celebrity, um, not just with what's between the pages, but also what's happening between the sheets too. Uh, so those are just a few uh, titles that I am looking forward to. Um, does anyone have any questions about any of the titles I shared or any books that you're excited to read next? Uh, and I did want to mention, too, that if you are a fan of getting book suggestions from uh, libraries and library staff, um, we do have some upcoming book speed dating programs at various branches. Uh, and so um, you can uh, check out. I know there's one coming up um, at Green Hills, and there was possibly one. Uh, was one's coming up later in South Independence and possibly some other branches, too. Um, so do look for those on the events calendar. Uh, so Sarah asked, what was your favorite book you've read this year? That is a good question. Let me pull up what I've read this year um, so I don't miss anything. Um, as you can probably tell, I read a wide range of titles from lots of different genres. Um, lately, I've been really into um, science fiction, but a book that I read recently that I really liked was called Biography of X by Catherine Lacey. Um, this one is about an uh, artist uh, who paints, who writes, she does performance artists, uh, and she's recently passed away, and her wife is kind of trying to figure out, she was always very secretive, and so her wife is trying to uncover her life story. Um, and so she finds all sorts of interesting things about her past. And the book also takes place in an alternate history that has lots of really fascinating deviations from our own world. Uh, so I really liked that kind of happening in the background too. Um, that one was Biography of X by Catherine Lacey. Um, so Sarah and everyone else in the, in the chat, and what was your favorite book of the year, this year or recently? While we're waiting for people to put that in the chat, um, Beth, do you have anything else to kind of uh, let people know about to wrap things up? And mute myself here. Um, I put the link to the survey, <clears throat> excuse me, in the chat. Uh, so we hope you'll fill that out and let us know how we did. Um, that helps us with these programs. If you have uh, suggestions for other programs you'd like to see as well, we always want to hear that too. Um, the next uh, quarter's uh, version of uh, this program, Buzzworthy Books, will be August 22nd at 7 p.m. And I will put that in the chat as well. Um, registration for that is... <clears throat> open now on the website and of course if you uh, register even if you register now we will send you a reminder email um, before the program um, if any of you are um, interested in bird watching or would like to learn about bird watching 
uh, May 16th at our Blue Spring South Branch and here on Zoom at 6.30. Um, we are going to have a naturalist from the Missouri State Parks who is going to be discussing the basics of bird watching. Um, so that's always fun too. And I see someone said they loved Verity by Colleen Hoover. Uh, yeah, she is certainly, we can't keep her on the library shelves um, this year, uh, that's for sure. Um, but yeah, if you like that kind of twisty kind of suspense stories with uh, surprise endings. I kind of also liked uh, another one of my favorite books this year was I Have Some Questions for You by Rebecca Mackay, uh, which is about a woman who goes back to her boarding school uh, where there was a murder during her high school days. Now she's an instructor. Our students are creating a podcast and she's discovering all sorts of things that totally passed her by uh, the first go round. I read that one recently, so I will second that recommendation. It's a bit of more literary, more on the literary suspense side than Colleen Hoover, but it definitely has those kind of uh, twists and shocks and uh, suspense. Did we have any other questions or titles or anything that anybody wanted to share? Um, and I also should mention that I did email out uh, the link to the survey as well as the link to the uh, Biblio Commons list of Angie's titles. So um, if with that, um, we will thank everybody for coming and thank you, Angie, for sharing another list. I've I've sat here and added to my holds list as we were doing this. So um, we hope to see everybody in August. Have a great evening. All right. Thank you, everyone. Happy reading.